Welcome to the Principles of Performance podcast, where we discuss how to optimize your health, fitness, and performance. Drawing on decades of experience of working as coaches, consultants, and trainers to top performers, athletes, and teams from professional sports to top universities to the U.S. military, Eric Degatti and Mike Perry discuss topics and strategies of how to perform at your highest level and be your very best. Join us and our friends and colleagues who are leaders in the fitness and performance industry as we investigate and challenge the most popular training, nutrition, lifestyle, and recovery protocols. And away we go. Here we are. Episode number 18 of the Principles of Performance podcast. I'm your host, Eric Degatti, along with my co-host, Mike Perry. Mike, how are you this morning? Excellent. How are you today, bud? You everything do- good down in Germany? Uh, everything is great. And I'm very excited because our topic today, and this is going to surprise some people, as a self-proclaimed tough guy meathead from Jersey, you would think that the last thing I want to talk about and really get excited about is yoga, but it is. Mm-hmm. And, I, and, and I couldn't pick somebody better to do it with uh, than Gwen Lawrence. And Gwen and I met and we had a, a bunch of years we worked together at the Giants and uh, buckle up when you listen to this bio of what she's done. She's worked with over 3000 MLB, NFL, NHL, MLS, LPGA, NBA athletes. She was uh, featured in ESPN uh, magazine's best innovation in sports medicine. Uh, she's been practicing uh, as a fitness professional and, and yoga professional since 1990. She's appeared on every show you could imagine from the Today Show, Good Day New York, Dr. Oz. Uh, she's worked with every team you could think of uh, from the Giants, Knicks, Mets, Red Bulls, Rangers, NYCFC, uh, members of the Yankees, schools from Columbia, Yale, Manhattan, UNC. Uh, and then she's written books. Uh, she's got her own TV channel. She's got a million things and we're going to post it all up on the notes because it'll it'll take an hour to just get through all her accomplishments. But um, I am super excited to see somebody I haven't seen in, in too long. Gwen, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you so much. Wow, that was a nice intro. <laughs> I appreciate that. So thank one you. of the things that, that I want to start off with and then I have a kind of a funny follow up with this is... Um, is what I always thought you were amazing at is getting big male tough guys to get into yoga, right? And so uh, seeing guys who who are normally just grunt and groan, I want to bench squat clean, getting totally into yoga, and you have a a very elegant way of doing that. So kind of how does that come about of how you found your niche within pro sports? Um, How I get them to do it and how I found my niche, two very different stories but my husband played pro baseball and long story short I started dating him we were very young and I watched his his path to pro and at 16 years old my hair was dyed electric blue I had a folding chair back then and I just sat down next to the scouts and I start picking their brain I don't know who I thought I was but I did it. And I was like, what does he need to do? What does he have to do to get better? What, what time did you get on your stopwatch with the throw down to seven to second? And I started building this knowledge and I was a dancer and an art major in college, which doesn't seem related, but in terms of art, I had to do a lot of um, figure drawing. So I became just a complete anatomy junkie and then went to school to become a massage therapist. And it was just sort of the perfect storm. I was training someone in the movie industry. And she said, if I send you to school to be a yoga teacher, would you be my yoga teacher too? And I was like, all right. And that's how that started. And then I started to see how I could change the game and incorporate it into athletics to make their lives better, longer, and more well-balanced. So that's how that happened. It really wasn't my plan, but you know, fate, fate would have it. <laughs> yeah. And, and so the follow-up to that is I always joke with, with people, we would have these recovery days on Fridays after practice and we'd have multiple <laughs> stations set up. And so there'd be a station where they'd have like recovery boots and there'd be another station, massage therapist. Another station was hot and cold contrast. I'm and then I had about- right now, <laughs> what's that? I'm just a little scared about what you're going to say right now. Go ahead. 
All right. So, so basically, um, and then I had my station where I'd work with guys with any movement flaws that they had. And then uh, Gwen was a station where she'd go through some yoga stuff. And you basically, I think it was like 20, 30 minutes per station. And you had to choose like two or three out of the six or seven that were available to you. And it was every Friday I'd have like Eli and like a small handful of guys. And there'd be 30 people over by yoga, by, by yoga <laughs> with Gwen. And um, with that, not only, you know, is, is Gwen incredibly good at what she does, but I remember Eli joking with me, he's like, in this room, he goes, you ain't going to compete with that because she's far easier on the eye than I am. And so <laughs> it was very tough for me to get friends on a recovery day when you're competing with Gwen Lawrence. <laughs> and the thing is, and once they chose me and they see how I was, they were like, whoa, maybe, maybe we want to go to compression boots next time. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, I'll take that's it funny. anyway. <laughs> and that's the big point, right? Getting them in there first, getting them in there to sort of taste it and understand a little bit better mm. instead of their preconceived notions, maybe. Absolutely. So Gwen, where do you see yoga fitting in the continuum of athletic development, recovery, movement prep, core training, et cetera? So for me, um, I really, my company Power Yoga for Sports is based around six facets. And I think the misconception is that you go to yoga to become more flexible, which uh, especially with the Giants, I met up with a lot of um, resistance with that because they have this this thought that if they become more flexible, they're going to lose strength. So I would always say, all right, if that's what you believe, let's think of, did you ever watch the Olympics? Yes. Did you ever watch the gymnastics? Yes. Or watch men's gymnastics? Yes. Do you think those guys are strong? Oh my God. Some of the strongest that I've ever seen. I think those guys are flexible. Wah, wah. They're like, I got it. Right. So <laughs> get them to go with flexibility, but the six aspects that we focus on and that I think gives my type of yoga longevity is it's about balance. So physical balance and symmetry of the body and, and it's functional strength. So you guys might be working with weights and, you know, that type of strength training, but functional strength with just body weight, flexibility, and moreover working with mental toughness. So if we're holding a pose and yes, we do hold poses for five minutes, you know, pretty intense stretches, you have to start, you know, getting into that mindfulness practice that you're going to stay in this pose and you're not going to just bail because you can't bail in the end of the fourth quarter when you're down by three points. Right. And so it's about focus and also breathing. And I think those are six things that are super important to any athlete, little league to elite. So I think that's what keeps me there. And that's what inspires people to give it a try. Now, one of the things personally, I think is uh, incredible that you gain from a, a good practice. And it's one of the things I tell athletes, if I can give you nothing else, the greatest gift I can give you is better awareness. And whether that's awareness of the impact of sleep or nutrition on your body, or the mm -hmm. uh, realization of this is why I can't get my hips through on my baseball swing. Um, or just the awareness of, of how your body feels. And most of the athletes, especially when I work, you know, with the NFL guys was they don't, aware, they're not aware of just how crappy they feel. Right. Mm -hmm. And they just assume this is how you're supposed to feel. And they don't even know that they're off. And then once we we've worked with them, they now have the awareness to know, I know when I'm right. And I know when I'm wrong. And I actually know what I can do about it. And some, some practices within yoga, like, uh, I, I've done some yoga nidra, just kind of just doing this body scan of kind of where is everything at and, and realizing, wow, I, why is that hip just not calming down? Why is, why can't I just get my ribs to move on this side? So talk a little bit about how the focus of awareness can come out from a good practice. Yeah, that is a hundred million percent. Number one. I mean, how many times do you go through the day? You don't feel the clothes on your body. You don't feel your feet on the floor until someone says it. And how many times have you heard someone go, I was perfectly fine. I just went to pick up a piece of paper and I threw my back out. Well, the fact of the matter was you weren't perfectly fine. You were completely disconnected, right? <laughs> you, when was the last time you even looked at yourself in the mirror and taught yourself to see, are my shoulders even, or do I look like that? And is my eye shut down? You know, do I feel something on the left that's going to compensate and go on the right? So that is super important with yoga. And I probably drive it home 
in an annoying way to every pose they're in, you know, feel your feet on the floor, replug your hands into the floor. What, what part of your arm is touching? If you're here is the whole left arm touching and the right shoulders off the floor. Cause that's going to tell you something. And then you can back up. You can't figure it out. Your teacher can help you figure it out, but it's a hundred percent, right? They don't have enough of that for sure. Now, when we talk about yoga for the people who aren't as familiar with it, and I'm a, I'm, I'm a self-admitted hack in terms of the little bit that I know, but diving a little bit into the history of it and how uh, its central roots branched off into different, a lot of different um, machinations and variations of the practice. And so you had people that focus more on strength building uh, through it because they were always the strongest practitioners, like the Ashtanga and things like that. And then there's others that are more bi- biased towards uh, more meditative type of practices. So tell us a little bit about how, if I'm going to go sign up for a yoga class, like what do I need to look for? So I actually find one that matches what I need. Yeah, I would definitely push to find out what type of yoga it is. And from Ashtanga to Hatha to Yin, and then understand what your needs are. Are you going in there because you walk like a tin soldier and you're super tight? Are you going in there because you're mentally wound up? Are you going in there because you want a good sweat and you want a workout and look them, look them up. You can go on the web and there's probably 12 to 15 different types, if not maybe infinitely more. And you got to find that one that really suits you. You wouldn't, you wouldn't go and lift if you were, um, you know, your shoulders are fried and you have 800, although we would probably tend to to disagree. You've had all these knee replacements and, you know, you're not going to go squat 500 pounds. You're going to find that workout that works for you. And it's the same with yoga. Everyone thinks there's one type of yoga, but thank you for bringing that up because that's not the case. (laughs) Well, unfortunately people still do dumb shit. And that's why we have a job is because Mike and I basically teach people all the time of like, this is how you write a program when you don't have everything available to you. So uh, that's a lot of um, of what we do now. Now, Mike, your next question kind of to leads into exactly that. Yeah, absolutely. So <clears throat> how do you see yoga being blended in with traditional strength and conditioning models? Um, I, I see it in a few ways. It could be pre- you know, your pre-lift to really, if you're that person that has really stiff joints and really can't get really good range of motion and need someone to sort of observe you before to see if there's any imbalances. So again, if your shoulders are like this and you're going into an upper body day, uh, unless we address this, probably that bench press, probably the shoulder work eh, is not going to go down too well. There's going to be some compensation. It's going to trickle down into other issues. So I see it before. I also see it um, mostly with my athletes. It depends on where they are in their training cycle. So, you know, I could kick their butt off season. We can do, you know, pretty aggressive Ashtanga type flows. And, or if we're in season pre or post game, we might have to do more of a yin practice where it would complement your lift or your game and open you up in those sore spots and kind of realign and get the blood flowing and uh, stimulate the nervous system again. Does that, does that answer your question? No, absolutely. I, you know, I think, um, and and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's really dependent on the athletes and their needs and what they're trying to get out of that, that specific session. And um, again, I think that's the beauty of it, right? You're going to tailor it to the needs of the individual. You're not just going to say, this is what we do. We do it before, but it well for some people, maybe it's good, maybe it's bad. And, I think it's probably, you know, there's there's several variables that need to be considered. You know, is it in season? Is it off season? What are the needs of the athlete? What is their next, you know, hard practice? What is their next competition? I mean, I'm sure you're probably looking at all these variables and going, well, this is probably what we should do based off of the entire weekly or even monthly picture. Right. And that's really what sets power yoga for sports apart from an athlete going to any class where they would get some value in any class. But what I teach my trainees, I have a school now, I have trainees in um, 19 countries and 29 states. And what I teach them is you have to develop programs like you're talking about that are not only beneficial per sport, but per position, right? The, the O lineman and Eli had very different needs. Yes. Very different body types. So why would I approach their yoga the same way? That's kind of just a waste of their time. So I try to boil down this practice to exactly what they need per sport, per position, 
and where they are on that training cycle. And sometimes it's hard. I can go in and I can have a, you know, a, just a nice fancy program and it's all hips, low back, and they all come in with headaches and tension and shoulders and, you know, wrists hurting and I have to just change it on the fly. So I'm sure you've enc encountered that too, that you just have to really be open yeah, to be called, the best, right? It's called coaching. <laughs> That's mm -hmm. what we do. Exactly. I mean, it'd be nice if we could if we could write the perfect program, but I always, that's one of the things we talk about in, in our courses, like, Hey, you know, that perfect program that you thought was perfect. And then you come in and then you have to change everything. That's just called variability and learning how to be a good coach. Because if you try to force feed something that is not going to work for either the group or the individuals, you're not going to get the positive adaptation that you're looking for. Right. Absolutely. And, and another good point you make is that um, I think, the way I work with, and you can, you maybe have seen that over time, Eric, the, the way I work with athletes is very much as a, and I call myself and my trainees call themselves yoga coaches. So we're not going to go in and be like, it's okay. It's okay. If you hurt here and you need to come out, I'm going to, no, you stay in. We got three minutes on the clock and you're down by three points. You can't get out of that pose right now. Let's stay there, breathe and find a way, you know? So it's very, it's a very different approach, <laughs> a little bit more tough love than, than a normal yoga teacher. <laughs> hey, whatever works, right? If you got to play to your audience for sure. That's why the universe gave me three sons so that I could just carry my personality from home to work. It's all the same. <laughs> Well, there, there's a lot that I want to touch on there. And, I, and something I was going to hit on later that, that I'll just jump ahead to now is a, a lot of, I think, what it does in using in, in leveraging breath for a part of it and in leveraging mental components is being able to manage states and in sports. It, it, when you're in competition is being able to manage states is that this balancing and uh, yin and yang just is really looking at our, our management of our autonomic nervous system, right? Of yeah. parasympathetic, sympathetic, and we don't perform really well in that sympathetic state. So if you can get them to be in a stressful situation, but yet still be focused and be uh, in that, what people call the zone or what's become popularized with the flow state type of concept. So talk about how it helps you manage your, your state of being. Yeah. So one of the aspects, the mental toughness and focus is the mindfulness program for athletes that I incorporate. And that is, you know, you can be in that fight or flight on the field, which is pretty appropriate, right? We have, we have a job to do. We have to do it really quickly, but when the play is over and you're either on the bench, there's, you know, those little, you said, uh, you know, body scanning before that's one that you can't necessarily do on the field, but it's, slowing down the breath, breathing in and out through the nose, deep down into the belly, diaphragmatic breathing shuts down that fight or flight response and stimulates that um, rest and repose, parasympathetic and gets you ready and clearer thinking to go back on the field, access that playbook and perform. You, We've seen it before with, I'm not going to name names on the Giants, but we've seen players lose it, go on the sideline, do kind of silly things and then go back in the game and just make mistakes and keep snowballing. You've seen it with, with MLB pitchers on the mound, you know, when they're, when the hitter is in their head, you see their head get down and you're done. So that's another place that you really need to start in, in terms of performance, longevity and, you know, health, um, you know, on the field. For, uh, yeah. I love that. Yeah. You, we're all on the same page. <laughs> so I, I want to go back to blending it in with strength and conditioning and uh, a couple points. So the first one is uh, I can't tell you how many times and Mike, you probably experience it when I'm doing a, what people consider a, st a traditional strength and conditioning session. And we do something they're like, Oh, this kind of feels like yoga. It kind of looks like yoga. And I'm like, it doesn't look or feel like it. It is. I said, <laughs> I didn't like, I didn't invent shit. Like all of this is stolen <laughs> And I'm just repackaging it. And so as, as I still align from that Mike loves to use is I'm sneaking the vitamins in the food here. So what I can do is, is when I do things that are, uh, you know, a Turkish getup is, is just a yoga flow. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, when I go through some, some of the warm ups that we do, it's just a yoga flow. And so um, incorporating it in and sneaking it in. So it doesn't have to be this binary thing of I do my strength. I do my yoga. It could be I blended very elegantly. Right. And um, one of my kind of trade trademark things is taking an athlete in a sport in a certain position. And I do side by side with the yoga pose. It's exactly like it. If you just look behind you, you see the power lifter in a yoga squat. 
right? So I would train that power lifter to sit in that squat for two minutes and make sure, and then maybe go up and down, you know, three, four minutes straight, building the toughness, building that functional strength. And even your runner, that's beginnings of a lunge and a lunge twist. And so in terms of lifting, yes. And each sport in each position and all the movements in each sport always look like a yoga pose. Constantly and it's freezing that ESPN and taking a screenshot and putting it up against a yoga pose. <laughs> and then the other component of it is, is that it's also not binary in that people will hear about some, you know, famous athlete that changed their training and they said, oh, they got away from lifting heavy weights and now they're, they're doing yoga and look at their performances. Got So everybody says, well, I'm going to just drop everything and just do yoga without understanding that that goes against some of the principles of, of human performance and that it's there still needs to be an element of moving fast like we had Derek Hansen on the show talking about sprinting and talking about force velocity continuums like so just getting in that pose and holding it for two minutes doesn't mean you're going to be able to do it fast doesn't mean you'll do it a lot so there's still conditioning it has to happen to it but first you have to be able to get those joints and positions and postures to accept and control those those positions and then we can layer the other stuff on top. But if you just abandon everything, go to yoga, you know, with no offense, I always joke that if you, oh, if, 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 and, and so <laughs> the joke that I have is, is if you just abandon everything, go to yoga, I said, I'm this, I'm slow, but I will race any yoga instructor any day. Cause everything's slow, elegant and, and going <laughs> with you being an exception, Gwen, because you go to your LA fitness and find your yoga instructor. They're super bendy. And, but they don't produce a lot of force, right? They don't produce a lot of speed. So it's part of a continuum. Yes. And one of the magical equations in power yoga for sports. And the reason I called it power yoga for sports, um, which people sometimes don't understand because I think it's going to be power yoga. Like you talked about before, more of an Ashtanga kind of heavy duty. For me, it's strength plus flexibility equals power and I'm going to be there and help you with functional strength, all those other aspects of flexibility. So you can get more power to push off for that speed training with the forceful extension of the glutes and the thighs and the legs that they're going to get from you. But I've been lifting weights since I'm 14. And one thing that's not on that bio is in 1990, I was in Miss Fitness America on ESPN and don't even bother trying to Google it. It was way before the internet <laughs> and it is not, you're not able to find it, but I've been lifting weights for a very long time and I still very much enjoy it. And I think any training program really has to be a balance of all types of training for hundred percent sure. Hey everybody, a quick break in the action here. Hope you're enjoying the show and we appreciate you listening. We're working hard to bring you the highest quality content and best guest every single week. So if you could do us a big favor and go and like and subscribe to the show on whatever platform you get your podcasts on, it would be greatly appreciated. Be sure to listen at the end of the show also to find out where you can find out more information about our courses, as well as a special discount code for all our listeners. Thanks again, and let's get back to the show. Okay, so let's talk about another big element that we've touched on a little bit is uh, the leverage of breathing. Now, breathing has also become something else that's become kind of in vogue, uh, mm. which is kind of funny to say, like something that we yeah. do 50,000 times a day finally became cool. Um, but yeah. we talk about it um, uh, a, a lot now in, in fitness, um, but talk about the role of breath and and how that's pretty much the centerpiece of, I mean, uh, of, and even some of the, the, the terminology of prana and so forth is, is, is synonymous with breath. Yeah. So we've always been taught, you know, and, you know, in through the mouth, in through the nose, out through the mouth, right. And things like that in yoga, it's always in and out through the nose to again, stimulate that rest and repose so that you can get into a pose. Now, let's say you're in a deep stretch and it's one of the ones that we're going to hold for four or five minutes. Your mind is going to start telling you things. Your mind is going to start talking you out of it, giving you a million reasons why. And then I say, if this happening and they all start laughing I say I know that's happening because it happens to me too go back to your breath just focus and say inhale exhale or start counting the breaths and just like body scanning as a mindfulness tool counting breaths and really tuning into the breath is a way to find that strength the other uh, really important that isn't really touched on is when you I mean when you go through your normal day you're really only filling a third of the lung with normal breathing 
but to take that time during the yoga, just because it's convenient or again, bringing the awareness like Mike had touched on and to really fill the entire lung and flush the entire lung. And what that does is it's a way other than diet and stress reduction that uh, alkalizes your body and your alkaline body is a body that doesn't feed on disease and that recovers quicker and becomes a fat burning machine. And um, so that's really another nice little sidebar of what can happen with proper breathing. So Mike, I apologize. I'm going to, I'm going to stay on this one before you get to your question, because I want to dig a little bit, a little bit deeper into the breath thing. So what's happened now is you get, you know, these silly Twitter wars back and forth. Now that breathing has become cool is that, you know, one of the, the rebounds was let's teach people to not breathe with this apical type chest neck breathing and let's get them to breathe into their belly. And then everybody says, well, no, belly breathing is not the right thing because it'll stiffen your rib cage. Tell us what a real full breath should look and feel like. Okay. I never heard that, by the way. I, I for one reason, but... I'm not on yeah. social media or it gave me uh, like anxiety attacks. Yes, the yoga teacher can have anxiety attacks being on social media. <laughs> I dive in, <laughs> I dive in the pool of stupid of, of social media every once in a while just to see what we're up against. I got it. Well, then you can keep me posted. I'll have it filtered <laughs> for you. I don't want to go on there anymore. People are just too mean. But, um, you know... What you touched on is it's, it, it's not a hard, fast rule. So, you know, yes, that diaphragmatic belly breath is appropriate, but not when you're on the field, you know, you want that, you want to send the blood, you want the brain to go, Oh, I'm in peril, send the blood to the, to the legs and stuff like that. But so that you can get the play done. But on the other side of the coin, that stiffening the rib cage, uh, I, if you're doing a real calming three-part yogic breath, it would be inhaling through the nose. So you fill the belly, which a lot of people, you know, holding their posture and me as being raised as a dancer, I was always told to hold my stomach in. So for me to even exhale and fill my belly, it just makes my mind explode. So you put your hands on your belly. The first part of your breath is inflating so that that diaphragm moves down, gives the lungs space, hold the breath for a split second take in a little bit more, fill the chest. So that's when you would feel that expanse in the rib cage for sure, into the armpits, shoulders, pause. And then that last little suck of breath to try and fill the throat. Then you hold, I, I sort of um, compare it to if you've ever had French press coffee that we're inhaling, right? From the stomach, the chest to the throat, we're pulling that plunger up, we're holding, we're letting that breath steep in the body. And then from the throat to the chest, to deflating the belly, you push that plunger back down. And that is a really good calming breath. And then, like but the as you said, you don't always want that calming breath. And there's certain, oh. uh, certain things within breath. And, and I actually just got to see uh, Dr. Andrew Huberman live was in New York uh, a couple of nights ago and was talking about breath and uh, talking about the nervous system and how inhalation creates excitation and exhalation is, is, is the opposite is calming. So when you, when you leverage and exaggerate the exhale, like you're talking about, that's more of a calming breath. When you exaggerate the inhale, that's more of an excitation breath, which is not necessarily always a bad thing. So if you look at, I mean, what's been hugely popularized, and I'm a big fan of it, and a practice, I practice it uh, regularly, is is what's been packaged and known as Wim Hof breathing. Is just mm -hmm. yoga tumo breathing. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 to continue on that, you know, you want to go on the field. You want to have that that breath that's appropriate but you don't want to live in that state the entire time. You, you remember those Newton's cradles, you know, they have the, the beads and you hit it and it just goes, tch, 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 right? So you want to be able to settle down into that clarity and stillness at some point. You can't live your life up here the whole time because that's going to be acidity. That's going to be disease. That's going to be stress and anxiety, fear and trauma, right? So you want this on the field, then you go off, you know, defense is on the field, you're on the side and, you're settling down for a moment and giving your body that regroup, right? So uh, then you would feel differently. All right, keep going down the rabbit hole. One more breath question, Mike, and then I'll let you get to yours. So um, when people will do a mobility drill with them or uh, and they'll say, well, how do I know if I'm pushing too far? And the easy governor is your breath, is to say, if you can get there and still take good breaths, 
then you should be okay because that deep breath tells your body it, it's it's safe to be here. But if you get to the point, and we always tell coaches, if you is if you know nothing else about breathing, is monitor the breath, and as soon as it changes or it stops, you stop learning because basically your nervous system has gone into that panic mode. Correct. Hundred percent correct. Yes. Yep. And I say that in the poses. I say as long as you're feeling something and you're still breathing, you're doing yoga. Doesn't matter if you're in a full split or you're up like this you're still doing your degree of yoga. Yes. Yes. And, um, you know, and a little compression, you know, tension compression kind of awareness that brings us full circle to the beginning. When we talked about body awareness, right? It's yes. My breath is stopped. And why am I going to keep going back here with a, uh, you know, 50 pound dumbbell when my shoulder screaming and it's zinging, you know, and I'm feeling these electric shocks. So yeah, it seems, I mean, it really is, not rocket science, but, um, you know, what do we learn in school? I'm, I'm still scarred about learning trigonometry in school instead of more anatomy, right? <laughs> I would not, I was never going to use trigonometry in my entire life. Why'd they have to scar me with that? Why didn't they teach us breathing and, and, and about our bodies a little bit more, be a little bit more successful, no matter what you do with your job, right? Whether you're an athlete or not. Yeah, you know, one, that, that gets me thinking, I think in our world of strength and conditioning, we always talk, people want sets and reps and how many and, uh, you know, when we are trying to improve mobility, and we are talking about breath, that is where the awareness piece is so important, because some people will need five to seven breaths, some people will need 15, right? So that's, that's why it's so important to talk it to educate our, our clients and the people that we work with about the process. Because people just want the package. They want to just tell me what to do. And it's just like, well, I can tell you what to do. And there's nothing wrong with that. But if I can teach you what to do and, and you start to understand how your body responds and what your body needs, you're going to get a lot more bang for your buck because you are actually paying attention to breath, to movement, to see how your body's responding to, you know, these positions in the breathing. So um, I think that's a hard part for a lot of people because they just, they want, do, do we do five sets of seven or five sets of 10? Like which one's better? And it's like, and, and I hate to give people the cop-out answer, but it's like, it really does depend. Yeah. Yep. That's why I use, Eric probably remembers, a timer. We don't count reps. I time you in it. So you're going to go slow or you're going to go fast, but I'm timing you in it, you know? <laughs> Smart. Yeah. And, and we just completely disconnect from any thinking of let's count this. Because what do they do when they're, they know they got to do 10? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine, 10, right? Yeah, Exactly. Because we want to get it over with and check it and check that box, and that that doesn't work either. <laughs> no, it, time, timing is definitely one of the best ways, especially if you're working with a group at the same time. Because again, you give them numbers, ten looks very different to everybody. But um... <clears throat> telling them how many reps, you know, you need to fit into the package you were given. Like you said, you're fast twitch muscle person, you're a slow twitch muscle person. I don't know. Can you change that? Perhaps, but you're going to you know, utilize your gifts and we're going to design these programs in correlation to your job, your gifts, your body structure. So it's all, it's all in alignment. So we've talked about sort of the, the mental components, right? We've talked about mental toughness and we've also talked about sort of that rest and digest. Um, you know, for, for people that want to get a more clear picture of how yoga can fit into sort of their everyday life, um, where do you see, what's the best way to explain that continuum to people from, you know, sports performance and, and this really sort of high end uh, sort of performance profile, and then people that just want to learn how to slow down a little bit. Is there a way that you sort of educate people on that entire process? I mean, no matter who I'm teaching at the beginning of the class, I'm saying any new injuries, boo-boos, issues, mental or physical. I just want to hear it every time. And then I do have, uh, I don't really like to limit my classes to level one, level two, level three. I like everybody to be humbled or inspired by the people around them. So I have my own little warm up that I do all the time that where I can really spot what needs to be done at that time. And if it is drastically different, I can still work with two different people. I don't have to put them in that same whole, but it, it does come down to knowing what you need. You know, you may want six pack abs. That may be your goal or eight, 12 pack abs. But if you have other more pressing needs first, you really have to be honest with yourself. And then, and then the abs will come. 
So go deeper into that, like the hierarchy of health. Like we, we, in our course, we're big on checklists of saying, okay, well, we got to have this first before we even think about this. Yeah. Tell me about kind of that hierarchy. And, and we have a, a performance pyramid that I use to teach of where we have health as the foundation of all of it. Cause I say, it doesn't matter if you're not healthy, your number one ability is your availability. No one scored a touchdown or hit a home run from the training room, but health going beyond that of mental health of, of phys- your physiology being healthy and all the different systems being interactive. And then on top of that is movement. And then on top of that is performance. And on top of that is recovery. And then skill is this little you know, piece at the top. So talk about kind of your checklist of the hierarchy of overall wellness and well-being through yoga. Yeah, I, I would kind of be, I think I would be in alignment with yours. I like that it, that pyramid, like the food pyramid. Um, I think I would put, you put the health at the bottom, right? Yeah. You got you're, foundation of all of it. Are you 14 and, you know, in perfect health, limber, mind is open, it's not cluttered with crap yet. Or, you know, where are, are you post-surgery? Are you, you know, where are you in terms of health so that we can build that program from that stage of the, and then definitely mentally, we talked about that on the pitcher on the mound, right? We got to get the mind clear and sound and calm. And then you can have great form. You can understand what your body's doing and make adjustments in your training. So I think, I think I would follow the same pyramid that you would. I think that makes a lot of sense. It's a, it's a very intelligent way of thinking about it. Yeah. Send that to me. I want to see it. Do you I'm have going it written to. Out? I yeah. do. I'll show, I'll send it to you uh, um, right away. So I want to go back to something you said before about your, your scarring in school and not to get into, into deep, you know, <laughs> history trauma here, Gwen, but, um, <laughs> But it made me think of something. Um, my my younger son came home when he was in high school a couple of years ago, and he said, uh, "You know, they have us. We have us part of." I, I said, "What are you doing, gym?" He's like, "Oh, well, now we're in wellness." And I said, "What do you do?" He goes, "Oh, we're doing yoga." And I got super excited. I'm like, "Wow, we're finally getting someplace, you know, like that. That's being even thought of, let alone incorporated it." And he goes, "He goes, yeah, it's great." He goes, "Just we go in a room, we all go to sleep." <laughs> and i'm like no that is that is just the shittiest interpretation i've ever heard of yoga and but how could we actually do this right because we do have not only do you have stuff that's really being missed that could be incredibly valuable for anyone going about their lives and, and mm-hmm. being more robust and resilient and healthy but also the aspect of we're coming out of this this pandemic where kids are really screwed up and they were shut and they really need to learn how to, to manage their states. Um, how could we do that? Right. If you could kind of, if I could appoint you right now is, is uh, in, in charge of putting yoga into, into schools, what Which would that look what, like? You know, but it's a big struggle, believe it or not. Um, a couple of things about that, that I would like to, to touch on, but um, first of all, your son's out of, out of high school. I mean, yeah. can we just, Oh my God. That's crazy. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's a little scary. I, luckily I haven't gotten any older. <laughs> I know. It's not funny how that happens. My, my oldest just turned 30 and I said, now you are officially my brother because if people know my son is 30, they're going to start counting and figuring it out. So no more. Uh, but anyway, I, I think we really have to put the onus on the yoga teachers number one and make sure they're properly trained and there's too many weekend trainings and i'm sure that aggravates you you can't weekend train to learn how to be a a strength and fitness person strength and conditioning person and you certainly can't do that with yoga either and and then again back to one of your points is structuring these programs so i do still teach some high school teams and i do love that level because they're still so hungry not like the pros and uh, i do my warm-up I kick their butt a little appropriate to the sport that they're in. And then we do our relaxation. Now, that being said, if uh, we just did a 40 minute series and program and I bring them into this final relaxation, there's always a snore or two. But if their goal is to go in there and know they're going to sleep, I I think that that's, um, that's a little bit of a shame and a little waste of their time and definitely have to put the onus on training the teachers a little bit better. And when I do my final relaxation, they're also in a stretch. They're not just lying down on the mat, super comfy. So uh, we do supported fish and they have a block in their back. 
<laughs> so we get some nice spinal extension. We open the lungs and the chest and their heads should be to the floor. And if they're not, they, they're here. So they are doing a little work and they fall asleep a little bit less. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and for the, the people listening uh, to the audio of this, make sure you check out the, the video on YouTube. And we'll also definitely post that as one of our highlights this week. And, and I think going back to the, to the schools and, and it's something that we assume that kids are going to, you know, poo poo and laugh off. But like I've put it in with some of my high school teams and high school football players. Um, and it, that's some of the things they feedback that they like the most, like at the end of like a recovery session or even like adding it in with some visualization and kind of talking them through um, of just getting it to, to breathe deep and settle down. Cause that may be the only time they've ever actually like paused and, and experienced silence experienced um, being just nothing to do. You're not on your phone. You don't have to take a test. You're not at practice. You're not trying to get back and forth. You have, this is it just shut down and just be. Yep. And um, yeah, I make sure all phones are out and off, except for maybe the one kid that might put some nice music on at the end. But um, absolutely, that's the, you know, the only time that they're, I could pretty much guarantee that they're, they're slowing down for sure. Um, I was gonna say something, but it just went out of my head about that. I'll think about it later. I want to know where you find a high school kid that's got nice music on their phone. I let the kids run the, run the music in the weight room. And every yeah. week I say, you know, last week I thought I heard the shittiest music ever. And then this week you topped it. <laughs> <laughs> and I sound like, definitely sound like the boomer old guy, but it is awful what they listen to. So hey, let me I'm, know where you I'm find I'm getting a kid there now music. too, man. I'm like, I'm talking to the kids and I'm just like, I just feel like I'm the guy that's like, just get off my lawn. Like I just see it. Like I feel like. <laughs> We're like those commercials where we're starting to sound like our parents. Yeah, a hundred percent. You don't know music. <laughs> this isn't real rap. Where's Run yeah. DMC? Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm so in age category. <laughs> wow, this time is flying by. So I, I, I want to make sure that we get everything in, um, Mike. I know you, you. I've interrupted you quite a bit because I've been jumping all over the place because I had all these questions that I had for Gwen. What, is what are you thinking about right now? You know, you know, I think about sort of the, the sports performance aspect and working with athletes, and I think it, that they're so sort of hammered with the go, go, go sort of mindset. you got to do more, right? You look at these, you know, I'm working with 40, I'm doing consulting with 40 soccer players right now, and, and, and this is a small school, and these kids are go, 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 and um, I think because of the nature of what they're trying to do, all these kids are trying to, you know, get uh, basically sign a pro contract. And, um, you know, I think one thing that they really athletes in general could use is just the ability to just turn off the electronics, understand that quiet is good. And if they can, if they can settle their mind, right. And they can improve their overall, you know, tissue extensibility and, and their movement profile. I think this is such a necessary thing, but again, it comes down to the education because it's not just hanging out in a hot room and, you know, sweating it off. Like there's nothing wrong with that. That's going to serve a purpose. But I feel like even more so now athletes need the mental side of, of yoga and, and the mental side of breath. I would say even more so than the sort of performance side and the musculoskeletal side, obviously we can't differentiate and separate, but I just feel like over the last couple of years with COVID and the way that kids are being pressured to, you know, play the same sport 12 months out of the year, I feel like this is such a necessary and smart just intervention that is going to really help more than just the performance aspect of working with people. Yeah, I, when I work with athletes, I think the, the best way to get into their brain a little bit is give them those analogies. So I use that, you know, uh, pond analogy. And if someone's flashing around in the pond and, you know, and freaking out and just causing a lot of ruckus and chaos in the water and the bottom of the water, it is just, mucky and dirty and you can't see clearly until you're still and you let that sediment go down all of a sudden even the grossest pond can become a little more clear and that's exactly how your brain works and I remember what I was going to say when they're in their relaxation another way I keep them awake <laughs> is I read them um, inspirational stories so if it's if it's athletes I have a book called mind gym and it's 
individual short stories that on um, determination and, you know, all these kinds of things with real athlete names. And I have a lot of other, you know, famous fail stories that I like to inspire them by so that they tune in a little, but you will always get the snore. <laughs> That's awesome. I actually use a, a visualization thing where, I, and I stole this from a, a coach that used to work for me, where I kind of walk them through the process of saying, okay, let's, let's think about why we're doing all this. And I say, mm -hmm. all right, let's, mm -hmm. it's this high school football team. I say, right, okay, it is a cold December night and we play our state championship games at, at MetLife Stadium. You're walking into MetLife Stadium and like walk them through and let them feel every experience, like feel your feet on the cold ground, look around, hear the sound of the crowd, feel the chill up your arms. Think about what you're doing in warmups. Think about all the, you know, you picture the color of the other team's jerseys, like very vivid kind of story, and then kind of walk them through until when literally it finishes with like the buzzer just went off, you run on the field, like this culmination of everything and people, and it's just really powerful, the energy in the room when we're yeah. done with it. Well, that's proper visualization and bravo to you for doing that because you need to involve all your senses when you're visualiz visualizing and it takes it one step further, which I'm sure, you know, kids don't have to know, but it is when you're visualizing something in that way, with all of your senses involved, you are involving the same neurons in the same order that you would, if you were actually performing and then you're patterning your body to think and know it has already been in that situation. So things that you've already done and been to places you've been to, they don't make you nervous because you've already been there. It's, it's those unknown first time things. So, um, you know, you see in the Olympics, the downhill skiers, um, or, you know, the ones that go down the ramp, is that the downhill? Is that downhill or the, the you know, technically like, it's all downhill, isn't it? Yeah, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> and even the races they're at the top before they go ahead and they're going like this. They're bringing themselves through that race exactly through that course and their and their core is engaging their legs are engaged and their ankles are kind of moving and sending all the same signals and when they go down there the body's like oh i've done this before i know where to go and you know and so you're doing exactly right and i think more people need to understand too that you can't just say see the super bowl ring right <laughs> That's cool, but there's so much A, B, C, D, E, F, G before we get the Z. And what Eric said is, is exactly right. I actually preface it with a story. There's a famous story of Jesse Owens, who was, you know, I don't know if he was sitting or lying in the inside uh, of the track with his eyes closed and everybody else is running their repeats. And the coach went to him, he said, when are you going to do your, your repeats? And he said, I just did in my uh, head. I never came across that one. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. So we have, <laughs> we have covered a lot of ground here. Um, as I said in the beginning, you do a lot of different things. And you, you mentioned some of the stuff between your, you know, uh, certifying professionals and then also working with teams and consulting. Tell us kind of what you're, you're working on now and, uh, and what new and exciting stuff you have coming up in the, in the months and, uh, to come. So uh, now I'm working on my fifth book and it's called self-care is not selfish. It's critical and it's some easy and um, at home things you can do to take care of yourself that you may not, you may already know and understand, but I'm trying to make it super easy for you. And that was born uh, from the inspiration when I went through my cancer journey and how the nurses took care of me. And I just went home and thought, who's taking care of them tonight, you know, and I thought I gotta do this book. So I'm in the middle of that and going to be part of, we've been talking about mental health, um, a show. I don't want to say too much just yet. Um, that is going to focus on mental health for veterans and anybody out there that needs it so that they can be right. And we can try and, and help as many people as we can there. And part of another thing that we're starting called the alpha zone, which you also kind of touched on and getting into that zone of thinking through a lot of modalities of training. And maybe you guys can be part of that. Maybe I'll refer you, but this is going to be some really famous heavy hitter trainers, um, accessing people all over the country, a remote kind of training thing for elite. So, um, those are the, those are a few things I'm working on right now, other than you know, momming and working out and trying to stay sane myself. 
<laughs> well, I'm in on anything, anything and everything, Gwen Lawrence. And so uh, before we wrap things up, I, I do want to touch on something that you just mentioned. We were talking about it before we hit the record button is uh, the unfortunate club that, that you and Mike are both a part of um, in both being cancer survivors. And so, uh, you know, we, we talk a lot about what our job is, is in building strength but you guys are living it, you're embodying it, and you guys are absolutely, you know, two of my heroes. And, and it is a honor and privilege to have you both as colleagues and friends and, and uh, so much you can learn from the, not only from what you know professionally, but your personal journeys. You guys are both amazing. Thanks, pal. Thanks, you gave me good bumps. <laughs> So uh, that's with that thing you've ever said to me, Eric, I'm going to have to, <laughs> can you, can you put that on the website? Cause usually you're making fun of the Patriots in my hair. So like, uh, I mean, I didn't want to bring it up. I didn't want to bring up the Patriots. I didn't no, want you, to Hey, you can break, we can have that conversation all day. I'm okay with it. <laughs> Yeah, I normally, so I changed this background setting. So we do some branding, but normally I have, if I shut this off, hold, uh, you have my two Super Bowl jerseys in the back that I constantly use as a reminder to kind of shove it in his face. But, um, uh, yeah, but he never, this is, this is the thing that he never says though. He bought those on eBay and because <laughs> you know, it is what it is, but no, hey, listen, he, here and that we'll take it. We'll take our licks. Uh, to be honest, I haven't watched the Patriots game since I, since forever now. So I'm <laughs> I'm too tired. If it's if it's a Sunday afternoon, I need I'm out in the yard working. I don't have time to watch football games anymore. Uh, you are officially an old guy. Love it. So happy. Careful. <laughs> All right. So with that, let's end on a high note, as George Costanza uh, always said you should do. Um, and and thank you again, Gwen, for being part of this. Uh, and thank you all for listening to the Principles of Performance podcast. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to the Principles of Performance podcast. If you've enjoyed our content, please like and share on your social media outlets as well as subscribe and give us a review on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, or whatever your preferred platform is to listen to. For more information on the Principles of Program Design courses and workshops, visit us at www.principlesofprogramdesign.com and follow us on all of the social media channels where we post new content every day. To save 10% on any PPD courses, enter the discount code PRINCIPLESPODCAST10 at checkout. If you have any questions we can answer or suggestions for the show, you can email us at info at principlesofprogramdesign.com or message us on social media. Thank you again for your support.